Oversimplified has been instrumental in my newfound love of history. From oversimplified World War II to World War I to the Russian Revolution that we're checking out now. Can I get like a one sentence recap of what's going on? Alright, well I guess that works. Okay, maybe uh, don't spoil the rest of this for me. I, I don't think I need to know about that. Welcome back, friends, and a special welcome, welcome to all the new friends out there. I'm Yo BGS, and yeah, we've been doing this kind of journey through history lately, thanks to a lot of your recommendations. And today, we're closing out the Russian Revolution with Oversimplifieds, part two of the Russian Revolution. And if you like these videos, if you think those intros are kind of funny or whatever, make sure to subscribe. Leave a comment down below if there's someone else you want me to check out. I've got like a dozen channels right now that have been recommended to me in addition to checking out Hamilton and some other stuff. So I'm always looking for new ideas, but here we go. Okay, we're starting with Ra Ra Rasputin, uh, the queen, and this is uh, Nick the Third, I think? They're dancing, they've got their ice cream, and here we go. While Nicholas had been busy playing with his new best friend, tensions in Europe had been rising. Aw, just... we were having fun. He was he was uh, Russia's greatest love machine, and then we hear tension is rising already. It happened that in 1914, one Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary went for a drive with the top down in Sarajevo. One thing leads to another, and suddenly Russia found itself at war with half. That was the one! That was the one where he, like, avoided the assassination attempt only to literally park his car, like, right next to the assassin who was like, well, I guess this works. Europe. A wave of patriotism swept through Russia. Thus the phrase, better to be lucky than good, was uh, uttered for the first time. The capital was renamed to Petrograd because St. Petersburg sounded a bit too German. Even revolutionaries were getting on board. To them, World War I was a big stinky imperialist war, but they didn't want their big stinky imperialist replaced by a foreign one. So pretty much everyone wanted Russia to win. I hope Russia loses. Except for Lenin. Lenin is like the, the to call him a killjoy, I feel is so... Thought of the day, staying neutral is a big plus. To call Lenin a party pooper is just the understatement of the century. Jeez, read the room, Lenin. Lenin hoped Russia would lose because that would help him overthrow the Tsar. As long as he did that, who cares if Germany blows up half the country? And blow up half the country, they did. An inefficient Tsarist government meant there were shortages of just about- Guns, ammo, everything else we need to fight a war. Why is there a Fabergé egg in there? Everything you need to fight a war. And if losing a teensy-weensy war with Japan upset the people, losing a giant Wyatt war like this was much worse. Soldiers were deserting, the economy was imploding, and in no time, Russia was starving. The peasants were getting more peasanty, the workers were getting more workery, all the while Germany was getting more Germanery. Dimitri- <laughs> Anything that sums up the first half of the 20th century better than the line, Germany was getting more Germanery. We need to win this war. I need someone with a great military mind to step in and take control. You're right. How about General Hickelooper? How about me? You can't run no. the war. No. Who'll be in charge of the country while you're gone? Obviously, my no! German wife and- No, you've got to be kidding me. I can't, but like, oh, you couldn't write, you couldn't write a more wrong Set of circumstances. No, 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 no. A homeless wizard. Duh. Nicholas declared himself commander in chief and went to the front lines, leaving commander his German wife. Why? Oh, why did Oversimplified do this? They made they made Nick so dumb that like you want to you you want to sympathize with him. Although again, actual history versus oversimplified history, I'm pretty sure that's not something you want to be doing. In charge while they were fighting, the Germans. It wasn't a good look. And because Alexander was so close to Rasputin, people believed that he was actually calling the shots and secretly destroying Russia, and maybe even boinking her. An even worse look. At this point, a bunch of- <sighs> Yeah. Yeah, man. Nobles just couldn't take it anymore. Rasputin is destroying the country. We have to break his magic spell over the Tsar. But how? He's magic. Hmm. 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 Dude. Are you serious? Very cool. There's no. Hey, way. There's a no way. There's no way that like. I, and I understand. I know it actually happened. But my brain just. I'm trying to divide by zero here. We're two minutes in, and this has been the most full bore ridiculousness like in ever in history. Rasputin, the sexy party is running a little late, but in the meantime, why don't you try one of these totally not poisoned cakes? 
Dude, why'd you say it like that? He's totally gonna know they're poisoned now. Shut up. I said they're not poisoned. Uh-huh. Dude, he just ate so much poison. How is he still alive? It must be the magic. Go with plan B. Yup. Is he dead? <laughs> See, Boris? I told you he was the answer. Now I feel like they're taking some liberties. Psychrist, and you didn't believe me. Can you shut up for one minute and help me roll him up? Are you sure he's dead? I don't know, but I'm supposed to be hosting a charity auction right now. Can we get this over with? <laughs> yeah, no, seems legit. Okay, now he's dead. The murder of Rasputin, just like his life, is shrouded in mystery and speculation. He probably didn't really die like that, but he also probably didn't really heal people. He probably didn't influence his Tag yourself, me and my coworkers on Friday at the radio station. I, seriously, Friday we ran over peeps to see if they bounce back. So might as well just be- He also probably didn't really heal people. He probably didn't influence the Tsar as much as people thought. He probably wasn't secretly destroying the country. But what he definitely did do, even in his death, was ruin the Tsar's reputation. Russia's autocracy looked more outdated than ever, and the Russian people were taking notice. Come on, men. Remember what we're fighting for. What? <laughs> yeah, no. We're out. <laughs> There's nothing funny about hemophilia. Notice. But Come good on, lord. Man. Remember what we're good fighting lord. for. <laughs> this poor kid. Yeah, no. We're out. World War One left Russia broke, hungry, and exhausted. And with Nicholas acting as commander in chief, he was getting even more blame. For the second time, Russia was on the brink of revolution. By 1917, sequel. Russia had this been time fighting it's a war the Ford for three years. They were running out of many things, most worryingly, food. On International Women's Day, 1917, thousands of hungry women in Petrograd were so sick of being hungry that they took to the streets. And it turns out it's not just women who experience hunger, but men too. What? So the next day they joined in as well. Now, and if you tell me children experience hunger too, uh, yeah, come on, come on, and pets. Yeah, right. Gatherings on the streets were forbidden, but I'm not sure how you'd arrest 250,000 people. The crowds demanded an end to the war, an end to food rationing, and even an end to the Tsar's autocracy. Now, normally what? the- I think I found Waldo. What is, what is this? What is this? This looks like the cover of, I don't know, like a weird can of soup of some kind. And even an end to the Tsar's autocracy. Now, normally the troops would deal with this kind of thing, but as it turns out, soldiers get hungry too. And they were also tired of having to kill their fellow Russians so much. So entire regiments mutinied in the capital and they joined the crowd as well, trashing symbols of the Tsar and his autocratic regime. It's, Things were escalating. It's in. legit tragic, you know? And that's why like, I feel bad for laughing at oversimplified. I know they're trying to make it comedic, but by the same token, this is just a... The the fact that a quarter of a million people just up and walked out into the streets is very quick. I mean, I'm sure it's again, it's going to be fixed the riots in the streets here had soon. long been dissatisfied with the czar since he would shut their parliament down anytime they did something he didn't like. They believed the only way to bring stability back to the streets was for Nicholas II. The uh the the young lad here with the Mol <laughs> Molotov cocktail and poor understanding of physics. But if you were a poor factory worker, you wouldn't know about physics. The only way to bring stability back to the streets was for Nicholas II to abdicate. The riots continued. The police fired on soldiers. Soldiers fired on soldiers. The workers re-established the Petrograd Soviet. Politicians began arresting the Tsar's ministers. He may have been an autocrat, but he just lost complete control of his capital city. Talk about embarrassing. Nicholas, the troops have turned against us. The people have taken over the city. They've even cut my phone line. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Hmm, the phone's He's got up. a damn banana. Come on. Come on. Oh my God. Like, look, look. So, this is probably going to get a lot of flack in the comments. Leave a comment down below if you want to drop some flack, by the way. But is Nicholas viewed as like Russia's George W. Bush? And literally the only, the only thing I mean by that is that they're a leader that for some reason history remembers is being unable to tie their own shoes. They don't know whether to wind their watch or scratch their butt. And the man's talking into a damn banana. Things must be bad. I'd better go back there. Nicholas hopped on the next train back to Petrograd, but he never made it to the city. His train was met by military generals and other politicians. What's going on? Nicholas... 
Look, man, we need to talk. It's not you, it's us. Aw, oh, who am I kidding? No, it's definitely you. During the whole crisis in Petrograd, the liberals convinced the generals that if Nicholas abdicated, the people would calm down, and the generals were on board. They didn't have time to quell the chaos, because don't forget, they were still losing a global, all-encompassing war against the Germans. Oh, yeah, that And with that the military thing. no longer on his side, Nicholas had no choice but to step down. Throughout his entire reign, he had done everything he could to keep all the power for himself. And in the end, that's exactly what left him with none. But then there was a big question. Who would replace Nicholas? Well, his son Alexei was next in line. Hey buddy, no, daddy no, couldn't no. handle the complex socioeconomic no, 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 problems no, no. of a giant multinational, multi-ethnic empire that's engaged in total war with all of Europe. You think you could give it a shot? Alexei just w- <laughs> Alexei just bled all over the halls of parliament. Poor little feller. Poor little feller. <laughs> Could give it a shot. Alexei just wasn't ready to be czar. Nicholas did have a brother, but given the state of the empire, he wasn't keen either. And so, 300 years of Romanov rule in Russia just kind of came to an end. The earlier 1905 revolution hadn't changed much, but this new revolution had left Russia without a czar. And still. But then you, so now there's a power vacuum and you need revolution the third, matrix revolution, to figure out who's gonna be uh, in control moving forward. Before the year was over, there would be one more revolution left to come. It's bonkers, by the way, that that's a hundred years ago. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, maybe it's the way Oversimplified is telling the story, but to hear it, you would think this was in like 600 or something like that. And then you find out, yeah, this was actually during World War I. Like, I don't know, for my history friends out there, do, when you start thinking about all the things that are happening at the same, like, does it ever scramble your brain to think about everything that's going on simultaneously at these points in history? Nicholas's failure as commander of the armed forces was the final straw that broke the camel's back. Do you think maybe you could have done any better? Well, guess what? It's time to find out in Rise of Kingdoms. Not what right. the, the, no, I don't think so. What the heck? Alexander the Great, if you want models. Oh look, oh, that it's master tactician and handsome general, Alexander the Great. If you want my advice, the troop is the most important chess piece in a battle. In Rise of Kingdoms, each troop I'm, can be controlled. No, come to on, man. Battle, you need the knowledge. The commander's skill is way more important. Each Rise of Kingdoms commander has their own unique real historical figure and leader. Where was I? Dude, it would be, it would be a god tier galaxy brain play if I was actually sponsored by them and I used Oversimplified's ad to transition into my ad. I'm not going to do that. I feel like the sub count would just go off the cliff because that would be grossly inappropriate. But bleeding all over the halls of parliament, uh, having your czar talk into a banana, it feels like absurd ridiculousness is sort of the name of the game oh, today. Yeah. Hungry woman. Absolute chaos and the end. I'm used to thirsty women. I'm all right. Slap the. I'm just kidding. Don't of do the czar. Oh. I mean, you can you can slap the like button if you want, but not for that. Hey guys, says here there's been a revolution and the reign of the czars has ended. Oh come on! I missed another one. Why am I even in this video? Well, it's not like you could have done anything. As long as there's a world war, you can't get back to Russia. Who wants to start a revolution? I mean, a revolution. <laughs> it out of the way so y'all can see this subtitle i don't know why who wants to start a room the helmet helmet von von erickson just tried to use thunderbolt and it was not effective as long as there's a world war you can't get back to russia who wants to start a hey use thunderbolt i mean a revolution Dang it! Despite getting rid of Nick, Russia was still at war with half of Europe. The Germans, however, had an idea. They thought that if they helped Lenin get back, he would cause trouble for the new Russian government. So they put him on a train. Destination, Petrograd. It was a long journey, and while Lenin was cooped up in his train, things in Russia were changing. Fun fact, this was the initial pilot for Thomas the Tank Engine, but PBS thought it was too dark for regular TV. Workers were taking control of their factories. 
and too kinky for modern TV? Soldiers were socking it to their mean old officers. Without a czar, a big old power vacuum had opened up, and someone needed to fill it. The liberals proposed they be in charge, and they set up the provisional government. The workers, however, had already begun establishing local Soviets, largely controlled by the social revolutionaries and the Mensheviks. And since neither felt like they had the power to oust the other, Russia ended up in a classic dual power conundrum. The two coexisted, with the provisional government becoming the official government, and the elected Soviets issuing orders to the workers and soldiers. This power balance was delicate, and all it would take is one bold revolutionary to come along and give everyone a big-brained beatdown. And apparently it was Walter White. Oh boy, Lenin's coming home. I can't wait for him to see all the great things we've accomplished. And I'm gonna show him my fan art. Oh, <laughs> here he comes now. Shut up, shut up! You all suck! The provisional government sucks, the Soviet sucks, even your fan art sucks! What? <laughs> That's so mean! <laughs> what? Is he a hipster douche? <laughs> In case you couldn't tell, Lenin wasn't a fan of everything that had been happening. In his April theses, he called the provisional I feel like he could have just stopped it. Lenin wasn't a fan of everything. ...and the Soviets, a bunch of big bourgeois bozos. And he kind of had a point. There was still a lot for the Russian people to be mad about. The provisional government hadn't got Russia out of the war, the people were still hungry, and the peasants were still hoping to get more land. Meanwhile, the Soviets hadn't done much to change things either. But even though they weren't perfect, a lot of people did like what the new government had been doing. There was progress. The secret police were disbanded, the death penalty abolished. They even planned to hold elections, meaning for the first time ever, the Russian people could choose their own government. Man, the smiley face arms up mo- I love that. For so like, I, if I watch all of Oversimplified's videos, this will never not make my day. To many, Lenin seemed like some out of touch weirdo. If Lenin wanted to go from whiny irrelevant zero to hunky communist hero, he'd need to shake things up a bit. So he and the Bolsheviks came up with a hot new slogan that promised to give the people what the provisional government wouldn't. Peace. Don't like war? We'll end it. Land. Groovy. You want land? We'll give it to you. Bread. Groovy. Hungry. Scooby dooby doo. Heck Lenin yeah. also called for all power to the Soviets. He should meant... set up a bunch of Quiznos because that, like, Quiznos has the most calories per inch of their sandwiches of like anything in history. Getting rid of the provisional government and having the Soviets run the place. A communist dream. The people liked these slogans and bit by bit, the Bolsheviks became more popular. Some Mensheviks even began switching sides. But even though the people thought Lenin's slogans rocked, as long as the provisional government didn't mess up, they'd continue to support it. So let's check in on the provisional government. Oh, provisional government, you've made a big mess. The provisional Seems government about right. lasted for just nine months, but those nine months were chaos. The people wanted Russia out of World War I, but Minister of War Alexander Kerensky thought instead of doing that, why not do the exact opposite? If the people saw more Russian victories, they'd have to support the new government. And that went just about as well as you might expect. These heavy defeats- That! Okay, now we're getting into the pretty serious parallels to nowadays. That feels- That felt- that Like, that feels like a lot of what- we're seeing these days where when you when you hear about the propaganda going on in Russia keep in mind this is from the perspective of an American and I'm fairly confident that we're getting a good amount of American propaganda over here but like when you when you try and balance those two things out it does seem like the the undercurrent was we're gonna win something and people will like me more. It's worsened the Russian economy and made the hungry people hungrier. And by now, I think you know what comes next. They trashed the place. More looting, more rioting, more violence. It was like the Tsar had never abdicated. Tens of thousands of armed workers took to the streets during some of the worst violence Petrograd had seen yet. And in response, Jeez. Kerensky called in the troops who opened fire on the demonstrators. For now, Lenin and other Bolshevik leaders wanted to distance themselves from the violence, but the crowds marched under Bolshevik slogans, and as a result, Kerensky, now the Prime Minister, took the opportunity to stamp down on the Bolsheviks. Their leaders were arrested, Lenin was accused of being a German agent, and he was forced to flee to Finland in disguise. This sucks! Now I'll never get to have my <laughs> Oh, Lenin is allowed to identify however he wants, and he looks beautiful, but that was not the cut I was expecting. Why are you wearing a dress? It's a disguise, idiot. Fair. And it makes me feel pretty. Kerensky Hell had yeah. successfully dealt with the violence, but he just couldn't catch a break. This increasing support for more extreme forms of socialism, along with the poor handling of the war, alarmed traditional liberals and bougie business boys. To appease them, Kerensky decided to promote a military legend to supreme commander of the armed forces. Someone who hated the revolution, loved the death penalty, and was devoutly anti-socialist. If this is Rasputin 2 electric boogaloo, I'm gonna lose my 
I'm gonna lose my brain. If this is John Cena, I'm running out of the room. General Kornilov. Hey man, thanks kind for the, the promotion. Same. That was real swell of you. Of course, with you by my side, who would dare try to overthrow me? I would. How about me? I did not see this coming. Unfortunately for Kerensky, Kornilov hated the liberal and socialist reforms of the new government, particularly the dumb socialist soldiers committees. The army was no place for undisciplined left-wing snowflakes. Fearing a Bolshevik takeover what? was imminent, Kornilov ordered his men towards Petrograd to oust the Soviet and take over. Kerensky freaked out and he needed help. Since he knew Trotsky was finger licking good at organizing, he and other Bolshevik leaders were released, and they, along with the Soviet, organized the defense of Petrograd. Kornilov had the power of soldiers. Who am I thinking of? I don't think... I don't think it's Trotsky, but somebody... Somebody in before the end of this video is going to meet a pretty grisly end and... No open caskets for that guy, but I forget who it is. But the Soviet had the power of workers, and they did what workers do best. Railroad workers diverted Kornilov's men away. Telegraph workers messed with his communications. They even infiltrated his forces and encouraged the demoralized men to desert. Ew. They were also armed en masse. But in the end, no fighting was necessary because Kornilov's coup just fell apart, and Kornilov was sent straight to prison. Everything was coming up Kerensky. Hey, thanks for the help, boys. Couldn't have done it without you. Now that there's no longer any threat, how about you, uh, return all those guns I gave you? No. Hmm. No. Oh, no. In order to kill a rat, <laughs> Kerensky had just given a gun to a bear. A Bolshevik bear. The whole affair was a huge propaganda win for them. They had defended the revolution, and their popularity skyrocketed. They found themselves elected to the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets, with Trotsky even becoming chairman in Petrograd. They were now in a very powerful position. Almost powerful enough for Lenin to- I like that Trotsky still doesn't smile. Everyone else smiles. They go to the traditional, the oversimplified pose, but Trotsky- not so much. In a very powerful position. Almost powerful enough for Lenin to return home from Finland and finally stage his long-awaited communist revolution. The Bolsheviks began planning their takeover of the Russian government. Some got cold feet and began arguing against Lenin's armed revolution in favor of a more peaceful approach. And they even wrote newspaper articles about it, which kind of gave the whole scheme away. The Bolsheviks are planning an armed revolution? I did not see this coming. Kerensky began Poor arresting guy. Bolshevik. He's just too trusting, man. If that's apparently his downfall. And as a result, Lenin and the boys felt they had no choice but to commence the revolution right now. Lenin was back in Petrograd, but was still in hiding. So Trotsky got the ball rolling, using his position as Soviet chairman to organize the Bolshevik militias. Now, if you were to ask Soviet artists, the revolution went something like this. As much as they would like you to think- Call me, call me cynical, but I don't think Paul Bunyan with a musket was- traipsing through St. Petersburg anytime soon. It was a glorious, violent, heroic takeover. The truth seems to be a little more underwhelming. The Bolsheviks just kind of walked into key buildings in the city and took control. Bolsheviks supporting sailors even brought in a huge battleship, but there wasn't really any fighting. Nobody really tried to stop them. In just one day, they took control of the city. Next, Kerensky just managed to escape before the Bolsheviks surrounded the Winter Palace, placing the provisional government under siege inside. Is it safe to come out yet? I think so. Fear my revolutionary might. Good work, that. Lenin. That night, Lenin came out of hiding to play a bigger role in the revolution. With him back at the helm, they had one more job to do. Storm the Winter Palace and arrest the provisional government. <laughs> and I'm sorry. I know I pause a lot and I know people get annoyed with that, but come on, Storm man. Come on, man. Wait. It's not enough that the horses have googly eyes, but Lenin just getting down in the streets. The Winter Palace and arrest the provisional government. And here comes the final showdown. The palace was defended by a force known as the Battalion of Death, who immediately gave up. And just like that, Lenin had won. As far as violent, bloody revolutionary uprisings go, this wasn't really one of them. But Lenin was finally in charge of Russia. He had spent his whole life dreaming of this moment. He set up the first council of people's commissars, his own cabinet, with him in charge. This was it. His chance to finally make his communist but utopia he didn't think about with what he would do and once freedoms he got beyond there. compare. Hey Lenin, before we took power, they were planning on holding elections. Shall we go ahead with those? Of course. You can't have a communist utopia without high levels of political participation. The proletariat should be free to we elect lost. who it <laughs> The social revolutionaries won. We lost. Those don't count. Lenin claimed the elections were unfair, and the constituent assembly they created was counter-revolutionary. He presented- Hmm. Hmm. 
I don't have tea, but I'm gonna sip on some water right now and just, hmm. Hmm. Very, very, very. Hmm. The new assembly with a motion that basically said, sign here and give up your power. And when the assembly was like, no, Lenin said, see, they're disobeying me. Proof they're counter-revolutionary. Shut it down, boys. Moderate socialists and others weren't happy when Lenin had the assembly closed by force. So that's what January 7th could have looked like. And when campaigners began taking to the streets, they were fired upon. For Lenin, setting up a communist utopia was looking suspiciously like setting up a dictatorship. While he was implementing many of the communist policies you'd expect, he was also refusing to work with other political parties and cracking down on opposition. Hey Lenin, are you setting up a dictatorship? I'll shoot you if you are. Of course not. What a crazy theory. Anyway, I'm pleased to announce I'm setting up a secret police force to repress and kill traitors. And by traitors, I of course mean anyone not loyal to me. Owie, 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 owie. The assassination attempt made on- Wait, that actually happened? I'm too busy being a- I'm too busy being a chotch to- I mean, I was listening, but that happened? And by traitors, I of course mean anyone not loyal to me. Owie, 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 owie. The assassination attempt made on Lenin's life in August 1918 failed. But in response, the Bolsheviks ramped up their oppression. But while all of this chaos was erupting back home, Lenin and the boys were also distracted by another problem. They were still at war with the Germans, and they had promised to give the people peace. So Lenin made Trotsky commissar for foreign affairs, and sent him off to negotiate a peace deal with the Germans. The Germans offered Trotsky really harsh terms, you know, because they were winning the war. They demanded Russia give up a butt-ton of land, something that would be devastating to the economy. Look, I know it's not great, but I think we have to accept it. Are you insane? This will ruin us! Hey Trotsky, you got a big brain, what do you think? How about no war, no peace? What's that, Mr. Trotsky, sir? It's simple. No war means we'll stop fighting the Germans, but no peace means we won't sign the peace treaty either. Then, when the Germans say we've just stopped fighting, they'll have to leave us alone. What? Something. Trotsky. That's genius. There's no I way that works. You. Do you want me to kiss you? Stop asking me that. <laughs> Trotsky's no war, no peace plan was a huge success. Oh, wait, no, just kidding. It went exactly as you'd imagine. When the Germans saw the Russians had stopped fighting, they slammed 700,000 troops deep into Russian territory with yeah. no resistance. Now, the new peace treaty offered by the Germans was way worse, with Russia losing a huge amount of territory, population, Jeebus. and resources. The Bolsheviks had no choice but to accept, and Russia was humiliated. With Petrograd now in an exposed position, Lenin moved the capital to Moscow, just in case. Things really weren't going well for Lenin, and many, many people were extremely unhappy with the Bolshevik government and its actions. Lenin, you've pissed off so many people that they've united against you. We're under attack. Relax, we always expected some counter-revolutionary pushback. I think we can handle a few angry Monopoly men. But Lenin, it's not just the Monopoly men. Okay, who are we up against? Well, the liberals, the social revolutionaries, national separatists in Poland, Finland, and the Ukraine, independent warlords setting up chiefdoms, anarchist rebels, the Green Peasant Armies, the Cossacks, the Caucasian States, the Baltic States, the British, the French, the Americans, and the Japanese. Oh, and a legion of Czechoslovakian soldiers seem to have taken over the Trans-Siberian Railway and stolen all the Imperial gold reserves. What? How could this get any worse? Oh, and it says here your mother-in-law is coming to stay. No! No! <laughs> a variety of anti-Bolshevik forces had united together to topple Lenin's government, and Russia descended into a full-blown civil war. Now, the Russian civil war was extremely intricate and would really need its own video, but essentially, the anti-Bolshevik white movement gained control of vast underdeveloped areas, while the Bolshevik Reds controlled the industrial heartland. Using this to their advantage, along with the surprising military genius of Trotsky and the shocking disorganization of the White Army, the fortified Red Army gradually came out on top. It was an absolutely brutal conflict, with both sides committing horrendous atrocities. To maintain order at home, the Bolsheviks began the Red... Which is wild because, again, like, isn't the war still happening? And, yeah. Terror. And the secret police would execute tens of thousands of suspected traitors. No one was safe from the violence, not even Nicholas himself. You've probably been wondering what Nicholas has been up to this whole time. Well, after his abdication, he and his family were placed under house arrest. At first, they were allowed to live in their usual luxury, but after Lenin took over, their conditions worsened. The Bolsheviks were just holding on to Nick until they could work out what to do with him, but the Civil War complicated things. The last thing they wanted was for Nick to be freed by the White Armies. And so, to stop this from happening, Nicholas's Bolshevik guards decided to act. It's not entirely certain whether Lenin ordered it, or if the guards were acting on their own volition. Huh. But on July 17th, 1918, with white armies approaching, they woke Nicholas and his family in the middle of the night and brought them into the basement. There, a drunken squad of Bolsheviks murdered the entire family. Evis. Nicholas 
The last Tsar, once one of the most powerful men alive, had met a brutal end. But after years of fighting and millions of deaths, Trotsky and his Red Army came out victorious. Wow, that was a close one. Okay, back to creating a communist utopia. How are we doing on that? Well, the Civil War helped create a massive famine and about 5 million people starved to death. There's massive inflation and the ruble is worthless. Hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of railway track have been destroyed. Disease and epidemics have killed 3 million. The population of Moscow and Petrograd has collapsed. Life expectancy has plummeted. Sailors in Kronstadt are rebelling. People are freezing to death in their own apartments and life has been reduced to a constant search for food and shelter. How then did they... Like, how then did the Russians provide such an instrumental force in World War II? Because they quite literally are like decimated. It feels like they're almost down to a tenth of their population. And yet they were, you know, the the bulk of World War II in a, in a lot of ways. So like, how does this turn around in, in only four minutes? Whoa, well, this just means I'll have to work twice as hard, day and night, to save the country. Nothing will stop me, short of a couple of sudden strokes. Get the doctor. One thing you have to keep in mind is that everything I've been talking about, the civil war, the assassination attempt, and Lenin's struggle to maintain control at home, were all happening around the same time. And it must have been extremely stressful. Lenin began getting headaches, insomnia, and in 1922, he suffered two separate strokes. As the Soviet Union was officially declared under a strict one-party system. And it doesn't... That's a photo. Um, but it doesn't help either that, you know, medicine in medicine literally a hundred years ago was nowhere near what it is today, let alone medicine in, uh, in, in a, in a climate that is not necessarily the best in one where arguably you're not sure who you can trust. So you may not be trusting some of your doctors that is uh, combined with all the other stresses probably, a predominant factor Lenin's there. health continued to decline, and his ability to lead the Communist Party went with it. Everybody assumed Trotsky would succeed him. He was a great speaker, he'd won the Civil War, and he had a dope-ass train. The last person anyone expected to take over was Stalin. Stalin wasn't a great intellectual like Lenin, or a charismatic war hero like Trotsky. He was, as one Menshevik described him, a great blur. Someone who operated in the background. Someone who you might not even notice. But it was in the background that Stalin would rise to power. Here's how it happened. After the revolution, all the Bolsheviks hoped to get a cool job in the new government. What did you get? Commissar for war. Sweet. What'd you get? Secretary. <laughs> Stalin was made general secretary for the Commissar. I feel bad for, I feel bad for Stalin, the oversimplified character, not Stalin, the individual themselves. Why is everyone wearing Adidas? In, this, in these paintings. <laughs> Stalin was made general secretary for the Communist Party. It wasn't what he wanted, but Stalin quickly realized that even though it wasn't fancy, it was a powerful position. As secretary, he had the power to give people jobs within the party. So he would give jobs to all of his pals, who in turn would give him their support. The more pals he gave jobs, the more power he got. The more power he got, the more pals he got. Lenin may have been having wall-to-wall -wall strokes, but he was... <laughs> There, there are few existences as horrible as somebody suffering from multiple strokes, but this, this animation of the, the depiction. They got. Lenin may have been having wall-to-wall -wall strokes, but he was still involved in the party, and he was taking notice. He wasn't a fan of Stalin abusing his position, or insulting his wife to her face. Lenin knew he couldn't let Stalin take over, but by this stage, he was just too sick to fight it. Hey man, tell whoever's in charge of giving people jobs not to let that jerk Stalin become the next leader. By the way, who did I put in charge of giving people jobs? That would be Stalin, sir. Blah. <laughs> Whoa. Deja vu. Lenin's last wish was to not let Stalin take over, but by the time he died, Stalin was too powerful to remove. He had his remaining opponents arrested or killed. Trotsky was banished and fled to Europe. Eventually, he would be assassinated by Soviet spies in 1940. Our I dear was Comrade right. Lenin has died. We should have a state funeral. No. Let's mummify him and put him on display so people can look at his dead body forever. You gotta be That's kidding gross. Me. You're gross. Guards, kill him. Lenin what? had waited so long to take control in Russia, but he never got to see his communist utopia. His short time in charge was spent dealing with the destroyed Russian economy, World War I, and the Civil War. He was cruel and merciless, but he really did seem to believe communism would make Russia a better place. Stalin, on the other hand, would take the Soviet Union down a different path. 
If you thought Lenin was a tyrant, well, you ain't seen nothing yet, girl. A secret police state, a rapidly militarizing superpower led by a paranoid man who deeply distrusted the West would see the world come to the brink of nuclear annihilation. That's right, I'm talking about. Yeah, and is, is this, is this the next thing that I should check out for Oversimplified? Let me know in the comments. But some of that, namely the deep distrust of everybody, can you really blame him? At that point, because literally everyone in power has been usurped throughout his adult life. So why would you trust anybody? I'm not saying anything else is right. I'm just saying that one isolated aspect. Well, yeah. Remember to click the link in the description below to down. I would love to. Um, You know, I linked... Oversimplified's original video in the description to this. So uh, if you want to play this, I don't know if this offer is even still good, but um, feel free to, to check that out there. Again, click on the link in the description. Okay, and then this is the other promotional stuff. No Easter eggs at the end, no rah rah, Rasputin. Um, I did not think things were gonna be getting worse than Rasputin, but they quickly of course, that is the area that I clicked to. I did not put this in in post. I clicked to a random spot on the video, 1139, and that's what we got. So we're gonna be uh, keeping that in mind, um, maybe a little bit later. Anyway, uh, if you like this video, leave a comment down below. Um, let me know if there's another channel you want me to check out. Let me know, it just anything that's on your mind. I read all my comments because I don't get as many of them as you might uh, think. I try to respond to most of them as well. Subscribe if you like uh, kind of this route we've been going on. I wouldn't be able to do any of this if it wasn't for uh, all of you. So take care. Make sure you subscribe to Oversimplified and me. And I'll see you for the next one.